Good morning and welcome to the Tohana Project Update here at Contact Energy. Um, today we're going to have our CEO, Mike Fuge, um, give an update on the Tohana Project when you're in and joined by our CFO, Lorraine Davis. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Matt. Um, and look, um, we, the purpose of today is just to bring you up to speed with the um, project. Um, we're coming into the end of the drilling campaign. Um, we've got a fair chunk of the contract um, well and truly contracted now. Um, and we did think it was an opportune time just to give you an update. So we launched straight into it. Um, in terms of the project and it's the world in which it's going to operate and the economics, um, the market conditions have materially improved over the last 12 months. Um, and the decarbonisation demand we expect to accelerate. Um, the resource itself, which Dorian will talk to, is absolutely world class, and that has enabled us to upgrade the expected station output to 168 megawatt. Um, look in the execution, um, it's it's a bit tougher, um, obviously because of COVID, um, but also because um, the um, station capacity expansion, which we've talked about, but the technology choices we made early in the project to enable that um, capacity um, increase to be possible. The project costs overall, we expect to be about 21% or $140 million higher than anticipated when we took FID almost a year ago. Um, look, what are the implications of this? Um, we're going to continue to invest in strengthening our renewable development capability. Um, it's fair to say um, we have a fantastic resource um, under the ground there and what it's beholden on us to develop our major project capability um, to ensure that we can deliver these projects well. The rates of returns, the IRRs for the projects remain incredibly um, attractive, particularly compared, um, compared to both renewable and more traditional alter um, alternatives. So you can see on the right there our assessment. Um, the market has only strengthened the economics and demand um, for this project. Um, the resource um, has got better and better, and in execution, schedule and cost um, remains a challenge, but we're building the capability to ensure that over the lot medium to long term, we indeed do have the capability to execute these major projects well. We just go to the market um, and how it's looking. Um, obviously, a feature of the last 12 months has been um, in the announcement of new data centres or people intending to build data, data centres, um, including uh, Microsoft, DCI and AWS. There was our own um, relatively small announcement late, late Perim, but the, the, these data centres we do see as a very positive development um, for New Zealand, particularly in the quality of the brands that we're attracting here. In energy intensive industries, look, TY, you saw the news this morning. Um, it appears that um, an extension beyond 24 for is more likely than it was. Um, the economics, as everyone's aware, have improved markedly, um, and you've seen challenges internationally with higher energy prices where aluminium smelting um, capacity has actually been taken out of market because it simply is not economic. Um, for our own part, we've signed um, two major electricity users um, around up to the Tahara project in terms of um, PPAs, uh, OG and PAMPAC which is a great vote of confidence both in the renewable project um, that is Tahara, but also on the intent of these international companies to stay in New Zealand for the long term to support the um, industrial base in this country. And of course, there's the work that we have been doing with Southern Green Hydrogen around hydrogen in the Deep South. Um, we've put the RFI, we've got a short list of preferred bidders, and we're targeting April 2022 for an announcement around that. So look, demand growth over the last 12 months has been incredibly positive. Um, there's also been a lot of hard work that's been going um, with process heat conversion. We're not going to claim um, all of the credit here. Um, some of our competitors um, have been very much involved in the conversion of process heat boilers. Um, and we also would like to acknowledge um, the role of ECA and the GIDI funding process, which has got stuck into um, process heat conversion projects. You can see the carbon price there, and that it, the rise over the last 12 months has actually got us to our future faster, where we can see um, process heat conversions as being incredibly competitive. They're now in a zone where, with the carbon price they would be paying on otherwise traditional gas or coal, um, actively considering conversion to electricity is a real viable option. And even in baseload thermal substitution, you can see on the right-hand side there the um, the amount that the carbon price is now attracting um, in terms of baseload electricity at 71 bucks. 
$75, sorry, and what the equivalent gas price would have to be to maintain um, that $85 a megawatt hour. Um, this, in, 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 in essence, um, motivated us to and Genesis to get together and sign that um, long-term PPA, which commences in January 2025 off the back of Tohara. Um, and we think that um, provides momentum for further PPA discussions. OK, on that note, Dorian, over to you. Uh, thanks, Mike. So yeah, I'll just give an update on the resource. So regarding the station capacity or the plant capacity, when we design the plant with the EPC provider, we always have one eye on uh, uh, a potential upside, depending on the quality of the resource. The issue is you only get to really understand the full quality of the resource post bid when you've finished your drilling campaign. The sort of things we look for uh, is the location of the resource, if you want it to be as close to the plant as possible, but also the temperature and the fluid uh, flow. You want to have the right combination of those three things. And uh, now that we've uh, largely finished all of our drilling, uh, we're confident that we do have that so we can take the plant up to 168 uh, megawatts which is about 140 uh, gigawatt hours of additional generation. And in terms of extra capex accounts for about a third of the additional capex increase that we're talking about today. The, uh, the capital required for the extra megawatts is relatively low at $2.7 million uh, per megawatt, uh, which is really good. Uh, and it does um, uh, obviously gets the benefit of being able to leverage the plant, the EPC part of it, because you don't need to increase the size of that. Uh, the extra capex is required for obviously uh, a slightly bigger steam field and um, a bit more drilling to uh, to account for the extra fuel that's required. Um, as Mike said, uh, the uh, the market is is looking more positive. Uh, in particular, you saw the announcement today from Rio. Uh, probably not a surprise to most people if you sort of understand the client demand and uh, what's going on with global aluminium prices. Uh, that uh, it, everyone was sort of expecting it to come, but it's obviously good that that's now been announced. Um, but what that does mean is the market's becoming more and more conducive for renewable development. Uh, and it means that understanding resource potential uh, is a, a very important topic in terms of actually understanding long term value. So in the um, in the past, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, consented fluid that's available to us, which actually uh, it's di very difficult for anyone to derive uh, some sort of meaning financial, meaningful financials from that. So uh, what we're trying to do now is, is talk about uh, what's the most important topic is actually how much extra generation do you think you're going to get from your fluid? And on the left hand side of your chart, that's, oh, sorry, right hand side of your chart, that's what we're doing. There's a, uh, a topic here called uh, specific energy, which is how much generation do you expect to get uh, per unit of fluid? And you can see there uh, the Tohara uh, resource is very, very good uh, at 45, I think it is, um, or maybe 46, if I'm reading from it, um, dollars per megawatt. It's almost um, dollars per uh, kiloton. It's almost double what we uh, are getting on the uh, Tohoka uh, plant that's on a different part of the field. And the reason why um, uh, the resource, uh, uh, the value is coming through uh, so much more there with Tohara is both the quality of the resource in terms of the heat within it, but then that allows you to leverage the latest technology around plant design. We're using a triple flash, uh, which basically means we're recycling the steam three times. And to do that, you actually need to have a high quality of steam. So it's those two topics, you know, leveraging the latest technology and the quality of the resource, which have enabled us to get um, such a big uplift in the uh, uh, specific energy relative to, to hook up. Uh, projects already on the field uh, and overall that's increased uh, our expected uh, output from the Tohara field uh, by 0.2 uh, terawatt hours uh, per year to 2.7. Actually um, those of you who have been watching content for a while will know this is actually the second upgrade. Uh, I think when I joined back in 2018 we were saying the field was going to deliver 250 megawatts plus uh, plus to hook up uh, which is uh, 2.3 uh, terawatt hours of output. So we're actually now 0.4 uh, above that, which we're very happy about. Uh, just to give yourself a full picture here, um, if you've got the same chart there on the uh, specific energy for the Wairaki field, uh, you will know why we keep going on about GF Futures and building a 170 uh, megawatt plant up at Tamihi to replace Wairaki um, based on this chart, because the uh, specific energy up at uh, Tamihi is considerably higher there. You can see at uh, 36 megawatt hours per kiloton as opposed to the 25 down at Wairaki. And that's what drives that 
six terawatt hours of additional generation that we get from Geo Futures for no extra steam uh, consent. So um, that's why we're so excited about that particular uh, investment. And overall, what does this mean in terms of our geothermal development? Um, currently sitting at uh, 2.3 terawatt hours uh, per year. Uh, we expect it when um, uh, fully built out in terms of consented uh, fluid from Tohara, plus the Geo Futures project completed. We expect it to increase by 3.2 uh, terawatt hours to uh, 6.4. It's a little bit of rounding, obviously, uh, in that calculation. Um, the, uh, I mean, a caveat here that, um, I mean, these numbers are based on assumptions and the more we develop the field, the more accurate we're going to get uh, at, uh, at those assumptions. And I think the last topic, just to mention around resources, you know, we're obviously constrained by the amount of consent that we can actually take, the amount of fluid we can actually take off Tohara. Um, so logically, can we can we take more? And I think the answer to that is, well, potentially, but we are a, a, more, a relative novice on the field at the moment, if you like. You know, the Tohoka, which is the one that's running, is quite small. Uh, in terms of the amount that we'll be extracting and re-injecting, that goes up by an order of magnitude when we're operating uh, Tohara. So that will start to give us more data around the sustainability of the field in the long term, which is going to be required. Uh, if we're going to ask for an increase on our uh, consent. It is fun to mind to us all because if that is possible, obviously, um, there's a lot of value in that uh, for us, but that will be a few years to wait away just to manage expectations. Excellent. Right, and this is the um, third um, item which we flagged earlier this morning. Um, so look, it's fair to say that the team, we mobilised them shortly after FID, um, but COVID has thrown a bit of a curveball at us. Um, both in terms of um, getting access to labour, um, keeping the um, site productive, but also supply chains. Um, and it's fair to say that over the Christmas period in particular, the team have worked incredibly hard um, to mitigate um, a whole range of potential issues um, quite successfully. The EPC contractor, we've given a COVID um, schedule extension and approved that. Um, and look, we've had to um, be very flexible and adaptable in terms of the construction um, strategies that we put in place. Um, it hasn't been a one size fits all. And in a lot of um, instances, we have matched the remaining scope with the capability of the different contractors we have here in New Zealand. Around cost, um, the expected um, project costs are up by $140 million um, to $818. That's the all in project costs. Um, and that relates to, firstly, we talked about the marginal capacity expansion um, as a result of the drilling campaign um, and the steam field separation system, which are now allows us to deliver that higher output. The drilling um, campaign in particular um, has been a fantastic example of risk mitigation um, with the much improved reservoir understanding that people have acquired as they've drilled, being applied to the next well and the next well and the next well after that. We've been delighted with those outcomes. The separation plant complexity, look, the triple flash, um, it was beyond um, what we expected, um, given some the experience we had um, almost a decade ago with um, Tamihi. Um, we're learning from that and we've um, got, a, got our, very much got on top of that scope requirement now with the near completion of detailed design. And then there's been the cost associated with COVID, whether it's been the escalation of commodity prices, um, the very tight New Zealand construction labour market with unemployment at an all time low um, and some global um, supply chain uh, constraints. Now, in the chart below, we have actually broken that down about roughly where that $140 million increase lands and how it can be divvied up. Um, but we're confident that number one, um, we've now got the capability in place to deliver the project on the schedule that um, we've, we've put out there in terms of second half next year. Um, and number two, we've got a good handle on the cost with an allowance for any more uncertainty caused by COVID. If we're going to develop um, this fantastic pipeline of development projects around Tahara and Wairaki, it's really important for us as a company that we build the major project capability and sustain it over a um, good long period. And so that's very much what we've been uh, um, doing in this last 12 months is complementing the resources we had with new resources, um, including Jack Ariel, the major projects director who has significant international experience and just building up the capability um, to match um, what was a very agile internal team. Um, we've had to um, think on our feet in terms of matching the scope that we had in front of us with what's actually available here in New Zealand. 
and we've brought um, together a um, range of contractors to deliver their different pieces of scope, whether it's the flash plant, the flow lines and pipelines leading into the plant, and the buildings which will contain the control, um, control systems and electrical equipment. Um, this will be key to the future. Um, it's important that once we get match fit, um, we keep going, we maintain that capability. New Zealand is a small place, um, major project ca um, capability by and large is in short supply. Now that we've got a good team led by Jack um, together, the intent is that we will maintain that team. In terms of geothermal development going forward, look, um, we expect that um, geothermal development typically will range between 4.5 to $5 million a megawatt. Um, which will be dependent on the resource quality, um, which Dorian talked to, and also the technology choices you make, whether you go for the open cycle or a binary plant. Um, it's important to hold those numbers, but also set them in context, remembering that geothermal typically has those very, very high capacity factors um, in excess of 95% compared to, say, 35 to 40% for wind or less than 20% for uh, solar, if you're lucky. Um, we expect that the increase in construction costs will be recovered through um, both the updated PPAs um, that we might sign in the future and indeed the market pricing and you can already see the effect in the forward curves um, on the ASX on that. Um, look, on that note, uh, we've got one more slide there which we issued today. We're happy to take questions because I imagine there's a few questions out there around both the project itself, um, the resource, what's happening in the market, um, uh, the commentary from Rio earlier in the day, happy to cover that full um, scope. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. If you have questions, can you please send them through the uh, Q&A function and we'll do it again for answer. Um, got a couple of questions coming through. The first one is from Andrew Harvey Green from Forsyth Bar. Um, could you please provide any more specifics uh, on the 34% of cost that has been tagged as COVID uncertainty as part of the 53% uh, um, COVID impacts um, bubble? Um, yeah, it's just the change of contracting strategy um, is to provide co cover in terms of um, any reimbursable elements we have, um, st we, we still have in the plant scope. Um, also to cover um, any um, material price increases um, for um, works which or materials which aren't yet ordered. Dorian, is there anything else? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of it's around more of the go forward stuff. Um, you know, we know we've reflected what uh, what's happened to commodity prices and construction rates based on what we know at the moment. Um, but as Mike said, um, because of the environment we're in, whereas previously we would have um, had fixed price uh, protection on some of these packages of work, um, we're not going to be able to get that. We don't expect uh, completely. So you've got reimbursable uh, elements now within there. So we've got to manage the risk around that, which I'm sure we will do, you know, based on the additional capability that we've got in uh, around managing um, uh, contractors, you know, productivity T levels uh, to deliver at a certain price, which is not something you have to worry about with a fixed price contract. So it's it's topics like that, Andrew. Uh, the second question for Andrew is, is there any impact on the TCC closure from today's announcement? No, um, there's not. Um, obviously, the whole thing with TCC is um, it's the, the flexibility that we have um, in picking a closure date. Um, and obviously, the market dynamics um, as demand holds up, um, they could alter that. Um, TCC provides an excellent insurance policy for Tahara delays. Um, so in that regard, we haven't changed our plans in terms of the um, potential closure 24. Um, but the, the big thing we hold on TCC, we are flexible and um, we will maintain that flexibility to ensure that we can respond to market demands um, as they arise. Uh, 
And um, Andrew, as you all know from our operating stats, we haven't been using um, TCC as much uh, as we've used in previous years. So we've got plenty of operating hours uh, under the previous C5 investment to keep us going if we need to keep TCC going for a little bit longer uh, to align to uh, uh, Toe Horror coming online slightly later. Perfect, thanks. Uh, next question is a uh, small delay to Toe Horror completion. Does the higher cost and supply constraints mean any delay for the next build decision? Uh, when should we expect the next potential FIE? Um, look, we're working on options and the, the short answer is no, um, because they're separate teams. Um, and the, the big thing that um, we've been very acutely aware of um, in the development of this geothermal pipeline is that we didn't overstretch the team. So the idea was that we always had a sequence so that the drilling, um, the reservoir modeling, um, the actual build, the EPC contracting, um, as far as possible was sequential. And so that major project capability that we build up, uh, built up, uh, build up under Jack can go from one project to the next. Um, we are still um, looking, um, we're still, uh, we still managed to submit our resource consent for GEO futures at the end of last year. Um, we're looking at other options around um, potential further development at Tohoka, um, and we expect announcements around the timing of those to come forward, but certainly Geo Futures on track um, for a mid, mid, mid second half 24-23 announcement for FID, um, and we'll continue to um, look at other options we've got to bring any projects we can forward. Yeah, the only the other thing I'd add on that is uh, we talked a bit about data centres and uh, they actually all want additionality, uh, which basically means that they want to be able to point to a specific renewable asset that's been built to supply uh, their electricity. Um, so obviously that means um, as these data centres come to New Zealand, you need to build uh, to support them. You can't rely on existing uh, existing assets and existing generation. The other point obviously is data centres load is uh, base load, like our geothermal. Uh, and um, in order for them to hit their carbon targets, you know, they need to actually be able to demonstrate that they have renewable supply actually aligned on a half hourly basis to their consumption. So that means other forms of uh, renewables which are more intermittent aren't attracted to them. So that's our understanding. So another big tick for geothermal. So um, yeah, I guess we should watch that space. Yeah. And can I just reference you back to that market analysis that we produced, the demand growth we've seen and one is over and above what we anticipated from TY, and TY is more likely than not, it seems, um, to stay open after 24. When remember our decision on Tahara, the FID decision was based on um, TY going at the end of 24. So all of those factors combined to actually put a pretty strong pull on everyone's renewable energy development pipelines. There's a question uh, just on that point, Mike, it asks, seeing positive demand growth signs in market, how much demand growth in gigawatt hours do you expect between now and 2025? Well, what we have been experiencing is in the, I think the last two years, one to 2% when it's all been normalized. I would expect that to continue. Um, the big unknown is in there is these um, step changes that we've seen with the addition of data centers in particular. Um, those announcements typically will bring with them anywhere from 0.1 to 0.4 terawatt hours with each one of those announcements, and that that could increase on that number of 1 to 2 percent, which is reflecting your usual economy growth, but also the um, entry of EVs into market. Now, the next question comes from Jeremy Kincaid from UBS. Uh, could you give us an idea of what the LCOE is for Tohara? pre and post capacity and cost upgrades? Um, we, we normally go for long run marginal cost as opposed to liberalised cost of energy, um, which would be uh, low 60s um, uh, now. Uh, so um, still when you consider what the um, wholesale price is and, and actually what you know we one expects it to go to in the long term around liberalised, uh, sorry, um, firm cost of long run marginal cost. Uh, that's still a pretty attractive project, uh, which is why you know it's a, an IRR uh, is actually, funny enough, not not too dissimilar to what what, what we originally thought it was going to be, because uh, the upsides and the downsides were largely uh, offset. Um, next question from Stephen Hudson from Macquarie Securities. Thanks, gents. Two from me. 
any obvious implications from today's announcement for SRB CapEx levels in the medium term? And two, have you built in a contingency percentage into the 818 million? So, how much if so? No, so obviously we're not going to disclose our contingency um, uh, for reasons of commerciality. Um, fair to say that we think it's an appropriate balance um, to reflect the mixture between a drilling campaign, which is drawing to a close, um, an EPC contract, which is lump sum, and remaining scope, which is a mixture of lump sum and reimbursable. Um, the other thing that we run over that is a prob probabilistic model um, between to ensure that our costs are reflecting. We're aware of what the P90 and the P50 costs are going to be. Um, and it's fair to say that our modelling reflects what we're putting in front of you today um, is looking close to the P90. So we take those levels of, of care around this and we think um, on that basis, um, we've got a pretty um, robust allowance for contingency. Yeah, and um, Stephen, um, we're not expecting to have any impact on our stay in business capex. I mean, the bigger impact on our stay in business capex is uh, Omicron and uh, lockdowns and having to sort of uh, isolate our critical workers around the operating sites and uh, meaning that we can't get as much sort of maintenance done as we would normally do. So uh, yep. no extra impacts from this. Yeah, the, the only sort of key stand business capex question uh, is potentially the Wairaki extension post 2026. The capacity expansion, but there's no um, read through from this uh, from these costs onto that final capex for that project. Still, oh, yeah, that's what seems to be going to Yeah, fair enough. Uh, next question from Cam Parker from Craig's Mission Partners. Could you please provide an indication of the remaining hours on TCC prior to closure? Oh, at the top of my head, I don't know. But we, I know we modelled it. We modelled it uh, a lot, and we've got enough. <laughs> oh, I know. Listening. We'll get back to you on the answer. I think it's 5,000, but don't quite me on that. Um, but as Dorian said, um, it was enough to get us through to end 24. We had a lot of that, didn't we? End of, yeah, end of 23 at least. End of 23. Um, question from Jonathan Davies from ACC. Are you looking to contract out a percentage of Tohara generation in PPAs prior to completion? Um, we already have, um, which of those deals with OG and Pampac and the Genesis Energy. So. If you take those deals collectively, they add up to 80. 87 megawatt, we've got capacity for 168. So we're just over 50% contracted, 50 um, and the other half um, nicely exposed to what looks a very attractive merchant strip. Uh, there's one final question um, in, the, in the chat, and that's a question on, do you have any comment on the Climate Change Commission's uh, position on new geothermal projects? Um, we've been actively engaged with the Climate Change Commission on um, initially, their initial position on geothermal was um, a tad negative. Um, and number one is, a couple of differences there, number one is our geothermal resource is extremely low um, CO2 intensity, both Wairaki and Tahara. Um, are between 20 and 50 grams per kilowatt hour, um, which makes them um, competitive with embedded wind and solar um, carbon footprints. Um, so we've engaged on that. The second thing which people always have underestimated is the economics of geothermal um, in this country is that they've always underestimated the consequential development pipeline um, that was possible, and we think it's got far more potential than what um, both, I think, with some of the Transpower reports and the Climate Change Commission in terms of their assumptions. Remembering geothermal, um, compete, particularly low CO2 geothermal as we have, um, its natural competitor overseas is nuclear energy, um, which is an order of cost, order of magnitude cost higher. The last thing is that um, what we are excited about um, and we're getting on with this year is um, the ability to do carbon capture from geothermal. Um, and we hope to have that trial underway by the end of the year. Um, the thing about geothermal, um, which people forget, is that the gases when they come off are very pure. So the CO2 um, is CO2 and CO2 alone virtually. So it's easy to capture and um, with a little bit of um, clever technology, get it back into the disposal stream and back to the reservoir from which it came. So we're quite excited by that possibility. So those three factors combined, we think there's a lot more upside to geothermal than maybe people thought there was 18 months ago, and we've been engaging with critical stakeholders on that. 
Great, thanks for the questions today. Thank you for joining us and look forward to uh, seeing you with our results on the 14th of February. Thanks, Paul. See you next week. Cheers.